So before we begin, as always, I want to just tell you a little bit about the Rothman Institute. Many of you are regulars, so you know about us. So every, but every week I wanna, wanna kind of uh, do this introduction. Um, our mission is to support, promote, and research entrepreneurship with a special focus on family, veteran, and, and really we're expanding to urban businesses to really focus on trying to, to use entrepreneurship to reduce poverty and urban communities. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do this without the TD Bank Charitable Foundation, Provident Bank, the Commerce and Industry Association, and Tony Russo, who may be with us later, have been wonderful supporters and sponsors of, uh, of the Rothman Institute and our family business program. One of the things that we're very proud of is that we created uh, uh, Family Business Week. And the whole idea with Family Business Week is to really encourage on the fourth week of October, really every day, but certainly on the fourth week of October, to celebrate family businesses and go out of your way to support family businesses. And in fact, Sue Slavin, Maura Panuski, the Rothman team and I are, are probably, we'll give you a warning, gonna have some kind of video contest to have people spend a day only spending money with family businesses. So, and really to track their progress to in, you know, around the country, really around the world. So, uh, so you'll hear more, more about that. In addition, I have a TV show called Family Business World. Our guest today, both of them uh, did a great job on the, on the show. Um, it now is uh, um, gonna be on Roku TV and you can find it on rvntv.tv. And the whole idea is to celebrate a, a variety of different family businesses. I've learned a lot and the audience has learned a lot about, uh, about the challenges and opportunities and how important family businesses are to, to the economy. Um, one of our signature programs is something called Veterans Launching Ventures, which has been around 12 years. Uh, what we do is we take veterans and immediate family members of veterans, and we take them through a, an eight-week program to help them develop their own business plan, and we continue to consult with them for months after that. Uh, but the whole idea is to really help their businesses uh, come alive and become successful. We love veterans, and we support veterans, and, and we are uh, always seeking to, uh, to, to include some veterans in this program. In addition, we have a YouTube channel, the Rothman Institute of Entrepreneurship channel. This video, as well as our previous shows are on there. There's an amazing, great information because we've had so many great guests like we have today. So I encourage you to check that out. Also the, the past TV, Family Business World TV shows are on that, are on that as well. Um, another signature program is our New Jersey Family Business of the Year. And so uh, um, October uh, of every year, we celebrate the best and brightest family businesses. And our, our newest category is the new family business of the year. People who, uh, who haven't been around for 100 years, like the Villani Bus Company, but um, who are, are wonderful family businesses who are five, younger than five years. Um, our winner, I see Dennis Mukula is on the line. Uh, Dennis uh, Mukula Contracting for their self-reported under $10 million in sales. And so uh, Dennis, again, congratulations. And our over 10 million, um, Mike Seitel and Norwalt Design. So again, I, it's, 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 these are amazing family businesses, but the applicants have been amazing. We are accepting applications. So we really encourage people, even if they've been nominated before to do it again, because we have to, we have to in New Jersey celebrate our family businesses. This is a program that I created called Entrepreneur Zones and we convinced the governor and the, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority to really advocate for it. So I'm chairing a working group in New Jersey about the creation of Entrepreneur Zones. And what are Entrepreneur Zones? Well, they're really, uh, you, you may have heard of the Opportunity Zone legislation, which, which does wonders for real estate investors, but doesn't necessarily help the local businesses. What we're trying to do is to find some way to finance tax credits and others to help businesses and economically challenged communities to help to turn those communities around. Um, I've written a number of different articles, uh, happy to share those about small businesses and family businesses, but it's important. One of the things that we're getting deep into when really working with our family and entrepreneurs about this idea called coach leadership. And I wrote a book on, on influence that we're all products of our influence. And so the, the idea of coach leadership is to understand we're products of our influences and that, that you know, we all, I, you know, often talk about this circle that you know, we aren't just independent. We, the way we think and what we do is about our inner circle, our social circle, our community circle, and our global circle. And it's important as we look at ourselves as leaders and entrepreneurs to understand that. And also as we lead others is to be a coach leader, is to really try to develop the people with us and understand the influences in their life. And so you're going to see more and more of this thought leadership as we, as we go forward. 
So again, with no further ado, I want to reintroduce Courtney Villani and Mark Speckhart. I'll stop sharing and we will begin. Um, I'll start out with uh, Courtney, whose uh, business has been around uh, a long time. So Courtney, tell us a little bit about you and a little bit about when was the, the company founded and, and who in your family founded the, the, the Villani Bus Company? Thank you, Dale. Uh, my name is Courtney Villani, uh, president of Villani Bus Company. And uh, we're in our 102nd year, 102 years. Started in uh -huh. 1919 with my uh -huh. grandfather, who uh, was walking home after a long day working on the Merck chimney and was tired. There was a trolley car strike. And he said, what I wouldn't pay for a ride. Mm -hmm. And he thought, I can't be the only one thinking that. So he went to the guys that he played cards with and got a loan and they got a milk truck. And um, I'm sure the, the time has expired on this, acquired some park benches and uh -huh. got it set up and pulled out in his broken Italian, a couple different options. Whatever had the best show of hands is where he went. And that's how he started creating the 44 line, uh, a transit line operation. And, um, you know, the rest is history from one milk truck to more than we need to count today. <laughs> yeah, and, and we'll find out a little more about that. But one of the things that's important is that when I talk, especially on, on the show about to family businesses, they often start with character loans. They start with this idea, no, you don't have to nowadays, and this is the problem with banking, is that you, you, you basically don't need the money. They'll give you the money if you don't need it. And, and many of our entrepreneurial businesses that are, that are multi-million dollar would never have started if, if it was this time of year. And so we as a country need to begin to rethink that and figure out other ways of financing new ideas. And so, so Mark, you, you've done a number of different things. And so what, what, say a little bit about your family business. Um, my initial family business that I worked for, my dad. Yeah, yeah my the initial grandfather. family business, and then we'll talk about what you're doing now. Okay, so my father or my grandfather started a company called, uh, well, with another family called White Conveyors, and they manufactured garment handling conveyors that went into dry cleaning. It originally started uh, mainly with the market in New York City because you had uh, the typical dry cleaner would only rent, well, they'd rent the, the first floor, but they also had the basement as well, but they never could utilize the basement. So my grandfather and uh, Mort Weiss designed a conveyor that actually went down into the basement of the, of the building and then back up. So they were able to utilize this cube. And from that, every dry cleaner needed to get these things. So it was literally, it just exploded and it started in New York City. And I think they've just marked their 74th, 75th birthday, something like that. Wow. Maybe? So in any case, so, so Mark, what, what was that? Was that, the, this is the, this is the same conveyor that when you go to a dry cleaner, we see, we see going around. This was invented Absolutely. by your family. Yep. Yep. Wow. You know, listen, and that, that one in that beginning at, at that time was a lot little, cruder, different, and you know, they evolve and they evolve, but, but basically it's still pretty much the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, yeah, it really, yeah. You, know, you go to the dry cleaner now and, and you start to, uh, to, 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 to see that. And so, um, so your family, what role did you have in the business, you know, as it, you know, as you got involved in the business? Well, I started off very young, you know, I, you know, I did everything from sweeping the floors to, uh, you know, working out in the factory, you know, obviously getting teased by a lot of the other factory workers out there while, you know, asking me for the pipe stretcher. There's no such thing, right? <laughs> you know, but of course they all got a kick out of that one. But uh, yeah, you know, so I learned to weld, I learned to cut, I learned to install the machines, I learned to build them. Uh, and then as then I, I, you know, I went to high school, college, out of college, I, you know, sort of going for my MBA, that didn't work so well, but I did the work study program up in, in Northeastern. So I was kind of fixated on going into Wall Street. And, uh, and so I ultimately ended up working at my, with my father at, in his business. And I worked from everything from service. And then I really got into the area that I really enjoyed the most, which was sales. And there were areas in, in markets that I thought were underutilized, I knew this dry cleaning market, just like it is now, how many dry cleaners do you think have gone out of business since this whole you know, pandemic? Thousands, 
and thousands of them. So there's other markets that needed to be developed. And that's when I started traveling over to the Middle East and to Asia and started developing a lot of the, uh, developing the, the massive resorts that were being built around the world. And I came up with a conveyor system that on a bar napkin in Vegas that basically made a automated locker room. And uh, wow. from there, it just well, went crazy. It was great. It was and, a lot of fun. Well, let's, yeah, we'll, we'll talk some more. I want to go back to the early days because because the two, another thing that I learned in talking to businesses is one, that the, the character loans, but the other is, is, is people who stay with the business often start out very young in the business. So Courtney, tell me, did you start when you were young and in, in, um, in the company? Yes, I thought that I was three, at three years old, I thought that I worked in the shop as a mechanic. <laughs> and yeah, absolutely, there's a picture of me in a little red t-shirt. You know, I was helping the guys push the tires. I didn't know there was anyone behind me actually doing the work. And now <laughs> my three-year-old son believes the same. So it's contagious, oh, yeah. absolutely contagious. And it's wonderful. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but then, a, but then, go ahead, go ahead. You know, there's a story about me, um, you know, I was just for a meeting one day and one of the buses had a problem and I am not a mechanic, nor do I claim to be. And at first I thought that was like a handicap, but then realized that, you know, you don't have to be everything to everyone, right? And um, I, I guess they thought that there was like a fire underneath, but I was a firefighter and I, I can't help staying away from that stuff. So, I, you know, I jumped on a creeper and I'm under the bus and my mother's like, what are you doing? You're in like a dress and heels, get out of there. You know, I was like, oh. The, uh, um, well, see, and, and, and the reason I highlight that, that's both of you starting young is that you find that when, if you have, a, and if anybody has a family business, when you start folks out sweeping floors, doing the, the menial stuff, they realize they value the business much more than if when you're old enough, you start out as a senior VP in the company. And, and, you know, it's just another company, but you really value that and you, you, you take it to heart. It is so consistent. So, uh, so that's good. So, so Mark, okay. So you invented this, this locker system. How does it work? I didn't invent what, what, it. I just came up with the idea and then everybody okay, else okay. went crazy and designed it. I just okay. came up with the thought. It was like, you know what, we have this problem uh -huh. and you know what, and, and the, the, the conveyor was called, you pick it. And it was okay. actually, I was in a meeting at MGM in Las Vegas, and there was a gentleman there that I was meeting with. He goes, you know, Mark, it would be really cool because we already had the conveyors there, but they were just very simple, uh, standard, you know, right, left, hand switch type of conveyors. He goes, you know, it'd be really cool if they, the employees could reach in and just pick it off themselves. You know, they, you know and I'm like, like, you pick it. And he's like, yeah, you pick it. And that's where we came up with the name. And then we came back and was like, okay, this is the fundamental structure of the conveyor. How can we actually make this work? And we just started, you know, you know, the people that were far smarter than me, the engineers and all these guys just started, you know, and I would sit back there and just stare at it. And they would be like, you know, what about doing this? What about doing that? And I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. Will it work? We don't know. There were so many failures you could, you know, before we even got to where we were or we are now. And, you know, it's, hey, it's nice because the competitors have actually tried to duplicate it. That's how successful it was. So it was pretty right. cool. Right. And we created a whole new market, you know, you know, just me yeah. jumping on an airplane, never being to Macau, never being to Hong Kong and realizing that all the big casino players were all going from Vegas over there. And I'm like, how do I get there? Jumped on an airplane. I ended up in a bar. I'm sitting next to this guy and I'm like, who are you? He goes, I'm the president of MGM Asia. Really? He's like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I manufacture conveyors in New Jersey for what? And I told him, he goes, oh, you got to meet up with this guy. Next thing you know, it just went, whoo. That's how, and so, and so what do they use it for at the, uh, at the casinos? What is it? So at the casinos, so they use it to store all the uniforms for the, uh, for all the employees. Ah. So if you go to okay. the Venetian property in Macau, you have 45,000 employees. So what you would do is you would have multiple doors. Let's say you have 10 conveyors. Each person is designated to a certain conveyor, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 
or one, two, three, or purple, yellow, orange, you know, all these different, we came up with so many different ways to identify. So let's say you're on number three, you always go to three, you scan your, uh, your company badge, and it recognizes Dale, you're a bartender, you're in slot 186, the conveyor spins around, stops at your slot, you reach in, wow. you grab a garment bag, you take your jacket, your shirt, and your slacks, you go off to the men's room, get changed, put your street clothes into the into the garment bag, scan your ID card at conveyor three, stops at 186, you hang it, door shuts, you go to work. Wow, what a great what a great system. And then we yeah. track all of the uniforms with an RFID. So we know that this is your jacket, this is your shirt, this is your pair of slacks. Everybody gets three parts, so they get three sets of uniforms, so they constantly rotate around. And uh, we know that your shirt at, you know, wash 49 is starting to look a little ratty. So when we scan it, oh, it's 49, we've got to get Dale a new shirt. Right, so right. So do all of this inventory tracking. It's super cool. Yeah, it's very, very cool. Very cool. So, so Courtney, so let, let's let's go back to the, the, the busing. So you, you um, how many buses do you have? Tell a little more about the size of your, your business prior to the pandemic. <laughs> yes, uh, before the pandemic, we were like our employee count was at about 237. Um, wow. Now we're we're not at 200 yet. We're not back at 200. Our last school district, we have school and charter buses. Uh, our last school district just reopened April 19th, which we were very pleased, very grateful for. Um, the charter bus business is uh, as quiet as a mouse. It is slowly starting to pick up but they're more uh, lawn ornaments at this point. Um, mm -hmm. The general business is down. Uh, we're grateful that it's back up to 40%. So we're very grateful wow. for that. Um, wow. And we're just you know, hopeful that it will return. And we expect like spring 2022, 20, next spring, for a, a better year for our charter business. Uh, wow. As most people have already seen in the news, the schools are expected to reopen in full status in September. Um, but yeah, it's the first time we were non-operational in our over a hundred year history. So wow. school busing and charter busing has a very small margin to begin with. Um, it's a community service, it's part of infrastructure. And like what most people don't understand is that small business owners for the most part are not rolling in it. You know, it's a, right. it's a cash flow feeding the community. And, um, you know, you're happy to get a little, a little extra cheese if you can, you know, and not every year, there's not always extra cheese at the end of the year, you know? So, um, you know, recession proof, maybe pandemic proof, mm, clearly not, clearly not. So this is not a one-year problem or issue for the industry uh, and other industry right. issues are a driver shortage that existed long before the global pandemic hit. And then right. with things like motor vehicle, having staffing issues and closing, uh, even though there have been increases to efficiencies in motor vehicle, it's a long wait to get your license in a difficult economy, in a difficult time. So it's a lot of challenges. So, so I mean, one of the things I was talking to someone yesterday, actually at the head of a chamber, and I was saying, it just seems like with small business, in New Jersey, across the country, that you're either, you know, successful and you have more money than you you ever need, or if you fail, then you're just a bad business person. That's <laughs> the view of small business in New Jersey by by a yeah. lot of politicians. It's like uh, they don't understand that most of you are good business people, just barely surviving. The margins are so slim, and then a lot of the regulations and other things hurt small businesses. And so, so it really is a challenge, and that's kind of what we want to do with FDU Rothman is to really be a voice and really advocate and. We've joined a number of chambers and really kind of get this uh, because this is where the jobs are as we as we go forward and 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 go back. So so I just admire what 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 you've done. And, and uh, one other question for you, then I'll go back to Mark. So um, are there many other women owners of bus drivers? I mean, of bus companies. So if I think about my school bus contractor association and my fellow contractor owners, I uh, I definitely think of I, I know I have one other female owned company. Um, I know that there's female leadership throughout. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, when you think of 
the school bus industry or thinking of a, a blue collar business like ours, it's, it's what you would expect, you know, it's mostly male dominated. And uh, I have had a positive in, in, experience in it. And, but I, also you as you already know, I was a firefighter for a number of years. So I don't uh, go into any situation with an expectation of being handed handled with the, you know, kick gloves, is it? I don't think so. Right, right, yeah, right, so, right. Um, you know, it's a low bid industry. So yeah. there's no, there's no uh, like alliances that work kind of thing. It's, it's, it's unfortunate for school districts that um, right now, the only authority they have is to either go into a low bid situation where they may not get the quality they need, or they can choose to do a direct contract with the contractor, but that's a very difficult sell up the river. Um, yeah. So as a school bus contractors association member and part of the board, we're working on an accreditation process so that a school district can be confident. Oh, they're, they're accredited by the state association. So we know that they've got the correct authorities that they're following and compliant with regulations, not only meeting, but exceeding whatever the minimum uh, necessary uh, rules are and regulations that we are um, exceeding the insurance requirements and have safe practices so that it'll help give an opportunity to show who is above board and doing business the way that it's supposed to be done and expected to be. Because we're not moving boxes. Right. right. No, we're it's a True, safe yeah. it's a safety focused business and it should be. Yep. The, the, uh, so so Mark going going back to you. So so you uh, uh, have been very open about family challenges, you know, mm -hmm. about the family business challenges. So you don't have to go in, you know, a whole lot of detail with family members unless you want to. But I know that there was conflict within the family around the, the family business. Talk a little bit about, about that. And, and, and I think it's important to be open about this and not pretend that family businesses are always copacetic. So talk about that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was a... Um... It was a real curveball, to be honest with you. I didn't see this one coming. Um, I definitely have learned a lot over the last seven years. Um, and I have a different perspective of, of it now than I did in the beginning because it was very hurtful. Um, you know, essentially, you know, uh, you know, my father would, you know, I'm one of seven children. I'm number six. Um, and my two eldest siblings have been in the business. My oldest brother has been there his entire life. Um, and then my younger brother or my youngest brother, uh, he's in the business as well. Um, and then there was a issue with uh, my sister who was in the business, the oldest one, and she left and she adopted two children and uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of debate going on between her and my father because she wanted a a leadership role, meaning being exactly like Courtney is, uh, but she certainly did not have your skill set nor personality. Um, and um, with that, I think my father realized that. Um, and she became frustrated and left and subsequently raised these three kids and um, was um, essentially, she was single, she never married. So she essentially did whatever odd job she did, but was very much taken care of by my parents. As my father got older, um, he ended up getting ill. He ended up getting diabetes, uh, staph infections, blah, blah. And uh, my mother, who was a bit um, upset with my father because my father, my daughter, my sister was no longer in the business. And at that time, when my sister left, my father actually decides to go on retirement and kind of just left my brothers and myself running the business. However, we had a complete support group. So I wasn't, I, I can admit to you that I didn't have the complete skill set. I didn't have the understanding 
What I did have was a very open mind that I could, uh, I could listen. Um, people would value my opinion, but I had valued their opinions more. Um, and uh, from that, I, you know, ended up basically being uh, with my younger brother being, I was the CEO and the president, but we, my brother, John and I were very close. My brother, my brother, my eldest brother, Steve was there, but he, he, he totally different skill set. You know, he was a tinkerer like my grandfather. He was an engineer. He was that kind of guy. He wasn't the one that would go out in front of the customer and so on and so forth. Anyway, Propellus going up, then I ended up, so now I told you I traveled a lot. So I was doing about 150,000 miles a year, uh, traveling back and forth. 08 happened, uh, our core business, which was originally dry cleaning and some retail basically dried up here. And if we didn't have the foresight to be able to go over to these places, we would have been in real deep pandemic mode. And, but we got through it. And uh, it was a massive learning experience. I, I learned dealing with banks and dealing with, you know, customers that couldn't pay us and, um, and working out relationships. I really got to know what people were going through. You know, we had a business that ran, but, you know, that young, that smaller business person that didn't have the line of credit, didn't have that. But you know what? If I could hold on to them, we could get through this together. And you know what? From that, I developed some of the greatest, not only relationships, but I learned so much from them. So in the end, ultimately, I ended up getting cancer. Uh, I was uh, pretty much have one foot in the grave and one on a banana peel. And, uh, but I was able to pull it off. Um, thank God for great doctors and, um, an amazing support group um and um and uh somebody's watching over me uh but i you know uh i that was probably one of the greatest experiences that i've went through because it was it was extremely humbling it uh it, it really it, it you know it really just punched me in the gut and really got me to put on a whole different perspective of looking at life, people, situations, your kids, your wife, everything. You know, I kind of fell in love with things all over again. And, um, it, and it was enlightening and I, and I learned a lot. And then I became a patient advocate at Sloan and I developed some amazing relationships with people. And I've lost a lot of really close people that I became really good friends with. Uh, I'm still very close with their families, their wives, their kids, their, you know, whoever. Um, so anyway, I'm out of cancer two years and my father's kind of not all there. And um, my mother really wanted to get my older sister back into the business. She was becoming a bit of a, I wouldn't say an empty nester, but the kids were getting older and one day my father said call the family meeting and you know listen he had already had a stroke there were a lot of things i'm leaving out here but the bottom line is my dad pulls us into asks us to come over to this house my sister mary's there and he goes um mary's coming into the business and she's going to be your boss wow just like that like what and then from then on it just you know listen I'm on the bank. I'm on. Um, um, my house is 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 collateral. She's got no skin in the game. She doesn't know anything about the business. And then after a year, she fires me. Mm. And I have, I got no compensation. I got three kids, wife, mortgage, everything. Nothing. I got zero medical taken away. Everything. And, um, and then she turned around and sued me for a non-compete uh, that I had signed 24 years ago. And uh, at that point, I had to make a decision. I had a lot of mentors that I had. 
And uh, they said, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I've been doing this my whole life. And there was a competitor that we had that was over in Italy. And one of my father's old partners who's since sold out, he goes, get on an airplane, fly over to Italy, meet with the CEO and ask for the moon. And I went over, flew over there. He couldn't believe the story. Matter of fact, nobody can believe this story anymore. And I think I'm going to come up with a Netflix uh, special yeah. on this one. And um, he goes, you're hired. I'm going to, I want you to represent us. And um, so that's what I've been doing the last seven years. And I've been growing the business. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. As tough and, and how scared I was uh, and how how I thought how worthless I really was um, and how I thought I didn't have the skill set. Uh, I'll tell you, it, it, you know, I, I should have been anticipating bad things from the very beginning and knowing that most things, most of them don't come to be, but I should anticipate it because if they do happen, I'll know how to deal with them. Just Ready like I had my physical the other day. I, you know, I'm cancer free 11 years. I still get a little worried, but I go into that hot, I go to the doctors and I'm like, you know what? It could be, it, it could, I could get the check engine light again today. Uh, something could happen. And then for 11 years now, I've got nothing but no check engine light. And, and, and Mark, thank you for sharing, sharing that amazing story. And, and so uh, uh, one thing that I'll say about Mark is that, uh, I mean, he's living life to the fullest. Every time he's traveling the world doing amazing things. I love living vicariously through, through him, but thanks for, for sharing. And so, so, so Courtney, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about your family and, and your, your dad and grandfather and kids. So how is that? I have to answer the door, but, but tell the audience about your, your family relationships. Which have well, been much more positive. <laughs> I will I will try to keep it as up as possible, but um, every family business has some drama. And I was just speaking to my um, safety manager minutes before this call and said somebody had approached me years ago about doing a reality show based on the business. And I, I, I had to show them that I wasn't interested without making it seem like there was a reason for them to be interested. <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, oh my gosh, no, <laughs> it's just too much. Short story, my son is uh, three years old. I joined the company six months after 9-11 when my father had got a stent put in, a couple stents put in. He went through prostate cancer, colon cancer. I was just coming into the business, coming out of um, like out of a, 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 nice, a nice life that I had. Uh, after going to Hofstra University and I was a firefighter, I saw a question, I was a firefighter in both Upper Black Eddy, Pennsylvania and Uniondale, Long Island. And wow. I left my life on Long Island, came over to Jersey uh, to work in the family business. I knew while I was going to school that the only thing that I did not want to be part of was I did not want to be in business. I knew for sure with certainty that I did not. I studied everything under the moon. Just, just not that. Don't put me in a box is all I thought. And uh, I came over and I worked in the family business and I, I happened to love it. Mm -hmm. I did it out of a sense of desire to be respectful for my father and his father who created the business. My father more than doubled the business and he, he was part of the great generation. He ate, sleep, breathed the business. He was it. Put the sun up in the morning and the moon up at night, you know, he was the rooster. So I, I said, I have to figure out a way though for it to continue in a positive way, but, but not the same way because I would like to have a life outside of my business. And because I'm quick, I learn fast. It only took me 10 or 12 years to not <laughs> continue to have 12 to 14 hour days. So, you know, catching on real quick with that kind of stuff, right? Um, <laughs> I lost my mother when I was 20 weeks pregnant oh, and I lost my father three weeks before my son's first birthday. Mm. I was very lucky to be able to work with them and have the time that I did. You never get over those losses if you're close and you're lucky enough to have that relationship. 
And I am so grateful that I got to know my parents as people, not just mom and dad. Because as mom and dad, you know, even as adults, we don't see all that they go through in a day to make a decision and all that they leave before, like at the door before they come home to put food on the table for us. So mm -hmm. I was very close with my family and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And I, 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 I'm just very grateful. Um, my husband runs the shop. I, uh, I had since, I've since lost my uncle who worked at the bus company to COVID. Um, oh, but oh, yeah, so, um, you, you know, you want some of that never ending story, plenty of it right here, but on the positive, I always, I always look at it in a positive and I had the time I had the relationships. I, it was good. I'll take good while it lasted. I will take that and treasure it every day of the year. So when I act, I act in a good faith to help continue the business in my father's legacy and continue on in a way that my mother and father would be proud. And I try to treat people with the respect that um, I hope that my son will get in the future. And that's what I try to do to stay mindful of it. And it was very, very difficult in the pandemic because I, I wanted to do for people but I had to be reminded, and it was it was through a great mentor who gave me just, you have to do what you need to do for the business if you ever want to be able to do what you want to do for people in the business. Otherwise, you may not make it through. And right. that, was a, cool. that was a sinker in the belly. You know, that was a tough yeah. one to swallow. So yeah. now we're trying to figure out how to continue on in a positive way with less than 40% of the revenue and still trying to rebuild some of that nest, you know, that, that net actually the net, you know, we were preparing for a rope. We had a robust savings for our hundred year celebration that went out the window. I was so glad we had it. If we didn't, I don't know if I'd be speaking to you from this position. I might be like, Hey Dale, do you know anybody who needs someone to work in a, <laughs> But it's, you know, it's always about perspective, right? And every day I'm grateful for the opportunity. And at the end of the day, we say, we live to fight another day. That's it. And if we can fight through that. We're, we're very lucky. So, so one of the things that, and this is this, thank you both. And, and, and I hope it's very clear to the audience that that positive attitude that you both have in spite of some incredible challenges has got you through. I mean, just uh, it's amazing that, and and I don't think I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs understand how important that is. It's not a, just about the bottom line. That is related to the bottom line. I don't know if either of you want to talk about the positive attitude that you have, and 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 even if you have some personal things outside of work that keep you that keep you positive. Um, you know, if, right. Mark, is there anything you're always positive? You've dealt with cancer. Is there anything you do? Is there a mantra? Is there a meditation? Or is there, what do you do to, to oh, stay positive? Gosh. Well, well, first of all, you know, spending so much time over in so many different cultures around the world, I've, I fell in love with, you know, I used to go uh, late night walks in Hong Kong. And I remember meeting an old Chinese guy that uh, was doing bonsais. And I got completely turned on by bonsais and now I do bonsai. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I- so explain, explain more about, for those that don't know, bonsai, what is that? What is It's it? a small tree. Right, and it could be small, anything, that's what it means. It means small, small tree. And, yeah. and it, it's funny because now on my, on my street, uh, my neighbor's actually into bonsai. And I was like, so now we, mm. we do bonsai together and we, I joined a couple of clubs and stuff. But, uh, oh, and, you know, I build stuff. I've always been a carpenter. I love to build, um, you know, all, I used to build furniture. I used to build all kinds of jazz. Now I take care of my, I just built my wife a, she brings in rescue bunny rabbits. We have 14 in the back of our house. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Yes, two of them. Well, New Year's Day at my house, fire pit. With all my friends over, four more bunnies came out of a hole. We have a problem. <laughs> now we have them all taken care of. We will have no more bunnies. Well, actually, I have one more bunny that's coming next week. Just so happens, his name is Stubbs. And he was 
he was uh, a pet of my, my second patient that I was an advocate for at Sloan Kettering. His name was Terry O'Hara. And you could see a video of the two of us being interviewed on, on YouTube. Uh, he was a first responder at, at 9-11 and he ended up developing the same cancer I had. Um, wow. Fortunately, Terry did pass away. Um, but his wife reached out to me like three weeks ago. She goes, can you take stubs for me? So I took my, talked to my wife. So now number 14 is coming next week. Wow. But, wow. But the big thing, the, the one thing that it really got me going literally six years ago is that I started studying philosophy. You know, I was raised in a, in a very Catholic family. Uh, I married a Jewish girl, go figure. But um, the bottom line is, um, and I bike, I, I, I do about 150 miles a week on my bike. Nice. And I love to listen to books and podcasts when I do that. And I've spent better part of the last three years uh, studying the ancient Greek Stoics and some of the really old stuff and some of the new translated stuff. And it really comes down to this, all this external stuff that you have no control over, you don't, you don't, you got to just roll with it. The things that you can control reside right here, right here and how you react to anything. And you know what? Most of the time it never happens. Right. Right. The, or it does uh, happen because um, you work hard for it. Right. The uh, Courtney, what about you? What's your secret? Um, that, that's great. That's fantastic. Courtney, what's what's your secret? And and then we my have son, a, I have a toddler, to and uh, you know his nickname is Godzilla. So <laughs> what's better than that? Uh, he's the light of my life, you know. And it's a great. It, I mean, it was a great distraction during COVID, and I'm grateful for the extra time that I got to have with him my bookkeeper's daughter watches him in his office right next to mine. So I'm grateful to have that one-on-one -on -one time together because as you know, everything goes way too fast, way too soon. Um, I'm really appreciative for my Volani bus family. Uh, I really do view them as an extension and we are, we are a team together. And so I'm, I'm grateful for every single person that comes into work. And I'm grateful that I have an opportunity to come into work and come into my office to go to work grateful that the world is opening back. My high school band director used to have four letters above his door in the band room. And it was C-A-N-I, constant mm -hmm. and never ending improvement. So every day I ask myself, what can I do? What constant and never ending improvement can I do? And I'm sure if you were to take a poll of my close team here, they might be a little tired of the constant and never ending improvement because, <laughs> you know, like I, I just was sharing today about how like, you know, there's no finish line, you know that, right? Like whatever it is, it's always trying to do something better. And then right. next, you know, we don't get to an end. We just continue right. to grow. And that's an exhausting idea for a lot of people, but I'm exhilarated by that. Uh, my father used to say about problems and I didn't understand how at the time he said, just be a duck. I said, what? You know, let the water roll off your back. Just be a duck. Interesting. And I was yeah, like, yeah. what are you talking about? He, you know, quick learner again. So it only took a couple, you know, 20 something years for that to really <laughs> work and sink in. But now I, and I, I don't know how to say this in a way that's not gonna sound really off putting, but I'm not a worrier. Because I don't believe that worry is, any use, is a useful and effective tool. Right. I am concerned about things, sure. But when I see a problem, I'm not going to just go around in circles and say, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Right. What do we need to do about, about it? Address it head on, like the Dale Carnegie method of, what's the worst problem? Address the worst and move on from there. Mm -hmm. Once you address it to yourself internally and accept whatever the worst possible outcome, the rest is breezy. I don't mean to make light of an, an idea or a problem, but problems are all we have in life to deal with. Nope. So if we don't view it in a negative mindset, but how do we do this in the best possible way? It's nope. just, it's about perspective. 
So uh, Mark, like you were saying about philosophy and, and just, you know, controlling and choosing your own destiny in your mind and how we think of it and how we react to it. Also still human and react in ways that I would like to improve on at times as well. So. That, that's a great, I mean, I, I, and, and we all have different versions. Mine is, you know, my worst day is better than most people's best day. So I have nothing to complain about. And so when I think many of us, you know, especially Mark, you've traveled around the world, you know what a bad day is in other oh, parts yeah. of the world. That, yeah. that is, uh, or even a good day in other parts of the world, the worse than the days that we have. And so we need to do that. Now, now getting to some of the questions, there was a question about succession and Courtney. So what, what is your succession plan? Now you have, uh, you know, you got a long time to go before three becomes CEO. So what, what's, what's that? What do you think about succession or have you thought about it? So before I lost my parents, it was my mother, my father, and myself. And there was an age gap between my parents where my mother was 21 years, my father's junior, something like that. Mm. So, um, when I lost my mother first, everybody was like, you mean her father, right? Because my mother was just 69 and my father was 90 at the time. Wow. Right. So, but my mother passed of a sudden onset brain aneurysm. Um, oh, boy. Yes. And uh, not to be, you know, it's, it's the reality, right? But it showed me that no matter what you plan, the plan's out the window. Right, right. So um, when I was dealing with that and pregnant with my son and anybody who's either gone through pregnancy been a mother or had to live with one as they were going through those stages understands that even a person who's never planned an ounce or a day in their life when they're pregnant is usually trying to plan out the foreseeable future for eternity and beyond at that moment as the, as the nesting stage, right? So three weeks before my due date, uh, my, my, half brother came up into the office as an unexpected visit the only time ever and demanded a, a leadership role in the company and what are you going to do oh, really? what oh. like oh. are you going to do this all by yourself and da, 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 literally pounding fists on the desk over top of a 37 week pregnant woman and I couldn't help wow. but laugh because I was like do you think I do this alone right, like right, right. Sure, I feel like superwoman some days, but I don't even know where my cape is, you know, like, <laughs> so, you know, do I have the answers for the future? No, but did I put some things into place that were not before? And I was so fortunate to put on, bring in a really great general manager and my bookkeeper and my husband who runs the shop side of things, the facility. I mean, I have location managers that are independent, responsible and do things with ownership and I can trust and entrust them. And that goes, you know, for my, it continues on through management and my individual drivers as well. I mean, yesterday I was so lucky that I got to do a photo shoot with my school bus drivers for a school bus driver ad campaign for recruiting school bus drivers in the state of New Jersey. And that's I was like, wonderful. yeah, that's great. They're going to be awesome. That's great. Wonderful. The, uh, that's great. The, uh, so, Mark, Mark, what's your what's your future? You like what you do. You're you're living a uh, you know very full life. What what's uh, what's your future? You know, it's you know you're not in the family business. Would you ever go back to the family business if the situation were right? Never. <laughs> Never. Never. That chapter is closed. Right, I'm writing fine. a whole new book. Um, you know, uh, I created my own business, so I'm not only do I rep. I'm rep the company from Italy, but I created my own business here. Um, and basically I'm a reseller. Um, we're on the verge of getting into some really, really cool new markets, um, doing a lot of e-commerce stuff. Uh, we're getting into the hospital market, which I'll be next week is actually a big week because I the company I represent out of Italy makes a scrub dispensing machine for hospitals for doctors and nurses. And it's virtually, it's, it's, they have them here in the States. It's a very large market. It's a $50 million market here in the United States. There's basically one player 
and I'm going to be the disruptor. And wow. so that's my plan. So I already, I already got the focus. I know who the customers are and we already got some pilots out there. And uh, this thing is going to be super cool. The, the technology on it's awesome. I'm integrating the RFID business. Again, I'm not the guy that's behind Oz. Um, you know, there's a whole group of other people. I just come in with a lot of, I ask a lot of questions and uh, I, and I walk around with a freaking notebook and I write a lot of stuff down and I, I have a guy that I'm partners with who has been a real mentor for me. He totally thinks the opposite of me. So whenever I'm discussing something, I'm like, where did you come up with that? And, you know, and so there's a constant challenge going on. It's, it's great. My son now is going to be a senior in college. Uh, who knows? This thing starts to really go nuts. You know, he's got a really great presence about him. Uh, he's athletic. He's, uh, he's smart. And my daughters are all smart. My youngest is freaking, I can't, she talks, you know, she's unbelievable. But, you know, I was just listening. My son's working as a sales rep now for a technology company. Of course, they're doing everything from home. So the other day he's up in his bedroom and I hear him doing a sales presentation and it was really, really good. But I was like, Kyle, you're talking too fast. And, you know, he's, and he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, just tone it down a little bit. And you know what? I, he actually listened to me. And uh, so it's, you know, so who knows, you know, I think this thing, I, it's really ramping up as far as the business is concerned. I'm learning, I'm flying by the seat of my pants uh, because I'm telling you, coming from a business that was being run like Courtney's business that had all the support and, you know, you had people that did certain things, the insurances, the administrative, the billing, the all, it all sits on me now. And, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you know, it's exhausting, but, you know, listen, I can do it from home. I can do it from anywhere and I don't have to go to an office. So there's a, it's starting to fit my lifestyle or I'm building That's my awesome. lifestyle. Yeah. My father used yeah. to say to me, slow down. I can't listen as fast as you're talking. <laughs> right. I can't hear it. As fast as you're talking. So, so, so Courtney, for the leaders that are on, you know, we have, I see we have a number of, uh, of CEOs with their own company and, you know, you've had to really battle some of the big, the big companies, the big bus companies and the advantages. Talk a little bit about how do you stay competitive against people twice your size, three times your size? A couple of things is that when you're a small privately owned family business and size is relative, whether it's 20 bus or 200 you feel like the big corporates are the enemy. Mm -hmm. Once you really get to know your business, you realize that's not true. Mm -hmm. Whatever I try to do well, I support it with training, education, give people time, respect people. I want to hear them. I want them to be valued. If you treat people well, you'll create a good environment for people. Mm -hmm. If you have a fair standard, and fair expectations, you'll get a good result in my personal experience. And so what I came to realize is that if we do our job well, and when we do our job well, it largely goes unnoticed in transportation as many other industries, probably same in the dry cleaning business and the, you know, all of those things. It's, it's great for the first conversation, but as long as you do your job well, People don't even notice it, and that's okay. And sometimes you lose a big contract. In 2019, I lost a 53 route contract because it's a low bid environment. Right. To, and I lost it to a large, large company. But when it came time for, for, to performance, it was seen the difference in the value. And so sometimes a customer doesn't know what they have until they've got a different experience. Right. 
Great, great point. Well said. You just great, gotta great. ride out that storm to get through to the other side. Okay, that's good advice. That's good advice. So we're, we're getting near the end, uh, Mark. I have to ask you, tell the audience, you know, because I do live vicariously through the story as you tell. What are the two most interesting, uh, and, and do it, we only have about four minutes, but two most interesting trips you've been on in the last, the last few years? Oh my gosh. Well, I, I, I have always loved Asia. So going through, um, yeah, no, actually New Zealand was probably my favorite. If there's ever a nuclear war, that's where we all go because it's the <laughs> most incredible place in the world. The people are phenomenal. Um, that, that, I mean, I can't even begin to tell you a lot about that. I mean, it was great. I love the Middle East. Uh, I love going to Turkey. I love going to Istanbul. I thought it was one of the coolest cities ever. Uh, I loved going to Jerusalem. I thought going to old Jerusalem and, you know, literally, I remember going when I went to, when I flew into Jerusalem and I was sitting at my wife's aunt's house in old Jerusalem and a guy and his wife pulled up in a car right next to me. And he goes, ask me directions. I'm like, I'm sorry, it's my first time here in Jerusalem. And he said, welcome to God's country. And it was just a phenomenal, I've never had seen a culture like that where you have the Muslims and you have the Christians and the Jews and everybody just co-mingles. And it's such an amazing, amazing environment. You know, regardless of what's going on now over there, um, it, going over to Bethlehem was insane i mean it was just great i just loved going over there i could there's a lot more that i could talk about but i only got four minutes well, well and that's that's uh um you know and, and the reality is those of us who travel the world you realize that the people are all good it's yeah. the leaders that cause all this conflict it's the people you can go to anywhere in the world and you just have a chat or you have water with somebody and they're good people it really yeah. is is good people and so and so that's one of the reasons we're pushing entrepreneurship because that and, and most people are entrepreneurial. Most people are innovative. They have ideas. They want to do stuff. They want to do innovative things. And, and we just need to begin to celebrate celebrate that much uh, much more. So final final comments, uh, Courtney. Any any final thoughts? As you know, as we've we've talked about a lot of different things for the audience. Sure, I think it's a time for people to support each other more now than ever. Uh, people, I think, feel less secure and need more re reassurance. I think that the in, the responsibility of employers is changing and for the better of our world. I think that we need to hold ourselves accountable to treat people in a way and give a life and opportunities and expectations that we want to live in. And remember that anybody who's coming to work is either doing it because they want to be there and it's a choice, a free choice, or because they need to be there and should be respected for that as well. So I think it's just an opportunity for us to all do our best for each other and our communities. That, that's great, a great, great comment. And we have about, about 30 seconds left, Mark. What, uh, any final words? I, I want to thank you for the conversation. I think I I think this pandemic is honestly is going to be good for everybody in a way. There's there's going to be a lot of new and great things that are coming out of this, and uh, I, I think everybody's just got to embrace that. I know it's been tough. It's been a struggle, um, and I just feel bad for the kids because they no longer can have snow days. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> that's the that's the. The worst thing long term. <laughs> so, so Courtney and Mark, just want to thank you all very much. As from the comments, the audience really, really enjoyed it. You're great people, and I, I was looking forward to this as I look forward to all of them. But you are special folks who've done some special things. So, take care, everybody. Have a great weekend, and we will see you at the next uh, Zoom at noon on Friday. Take care, take care everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.